Good morning and welcome. My name is Matthew Eugene and I'm the chair of Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today the committee will be hearing testimony on three bills. The first introductory bill number 1682 is sponsored by the speaker and seeks to repeal the city conversion therapy law. The other two bill introduction 85A and 1603 sponsored by Council Member Kellos and Levine, respectively, aim to strengthen protections against credit discrimination for those seeking housing. In 2017, this committee heard a number of bills aimed to at uh, protecting and uh, improving the life of New York City LGBT people. At the hearing, multiple witnesses testify about uh, the uh, process known as conversion therapy. This uh, treatment involves a range of practices that aim to change a person's sexual orientation so that they fit uh, strictly into the norm of heterosexuality. However, the American Medical Association has reported that leading a professional medical and mental health association reject conversion therapy as a legitimate medical treatment. As a result, the city enacted Local Law 22 of 2018 to ban conversion therapy services offered for a fee. Shortly after, it enacted enactment, a law suit was filed challenging the city's ban as unconstitutional as the Supreme Court and Federal Court have uh, be become more conservative LGBTQ advocates have become increasingly concerned that their right will be dismantled by the court and to avoid avoid problematic legal proced, uh, precedent, the speaker has made the very difficult decision to introduce introductory bill number 1682, repealing local law 22, introductory bill number 85A, sponsored by Council Member Kellos, would ban the use of tenant and blacklist, which effectively bar people from rental accommodation if they have ever participated in housing court procedure. In New York, the finding of housing court are part of the public record. This means that the tenant screening bureau who charge a landlord for information on potential tenant are able to source information from filing. The problem is, however, the Tenant Screening Bureau only provide basic case information. They do not indicate, for example, that a tenant has filed a case against the, the, their landlord who is refusing to do repairs, nor does the screening show the outcome of the case, including if the tenant wins. Therefore, just submitting a filing is enough to lend tenant on a tenant screening list and can prevent them from securing housing. In response to this concern, the state recently passed a law prohibiting landlord from relying on a tenant housing court history to refuse rental accommodation. Similarly, Introduction 85A will prohibit the unfair blacklisting of protective tenant and provide an additional venue for, uh, for to address through the Commission on Human Rights. Introduction 1603, sponsored by Council Member Levine, also seeks to expand housing discrimination protection. Credit score strongly influences whether a person can access housing. However, numerous studies have shown that racial dis discrepancies continue to negatively impact people of color when uh, these scores are calculated. To address this bias introduction, 
Introduction 1603, Bao landlords who are leasing affordable units controlled or subsidized by New York City Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, HPD, from considering credit score as well as consumer debt judgment or collection account from either the application or a member of the household. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the members of this committee who have joined us. And we have uh, Council Member Levin, Council Member Carlos, Council Member uh, Parkin, and Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. I'd like also to thank the committee staff, Belki Mirin, Senior Council to the Council, Senior Council to the Committee, Leah Squidpeck, Policy Analyst, and Nevin Singh, Financial Analyst, as well as my staff, David Suarez and Jim Fagan. Now I would like to invite Council Member Ben Carlos, <coughs> excuse me, to say a few words about his uh, bill, introductory bill number 85A. Good morning, I'm Councilmember Ben Kalos. You can, as always, tweet me and hit me on social media, at Ben Kalos. I want to uh, thank the Committee on Civil, Ri Civil and Human Rights Chair, the Honorable Matthew Eugene, uh, for leading us this morning. No one should face discrimination simply for having been in housing court. Tenant screening companies have a responsibility to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about those housing court cases. We can't have a legal system where somebody can go to housing court, be vindicated and even win against a bad landlord and then repeatedly be denied a place to live. Tenant blacklists degrade housing court and create a system where even if you win, you lose. Previously, landlords could refuse tenants based on their housing court history but the state recently passed legislation prohibiting the use of housing court history in tenant selection. However, the state legislation only allows the Attorney General of the State of New York to prosecute bad actors. Hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers are named in the housing court cases every year and they're reported on these blacklists. Uh, they're created by over 650 screening companies and the reports are sold by these companies along with credit reports and are often used to deny these applications to renters. I've been working on this since I was a chief of staff for former Assemblymember Jonathan Bing back in 2007 and this legislation introduction 85A largely mirrors that legislation uh, that would provide a protection for tenants by saying that going to housing court should be a human right and that if they felt that their human right had been violated, they would be able to go to the Commission on Human Rights in the City of New York to have them investigated or if necessary, hire an attorney for their own private right of action. Either way, this would bolster what we've seen happen on the state and we hope that tenants can win I want to thank central staff Jeff Baker, Rachel Cordero, Valkyse, uh, Leah, and uh, Nevin for who worked tirelessly on this bill, as well as a coalition of advocates led by James Fishman, Legal Aid, Housing Court Answers, and so many others. I've been working on this for literally a decade, along with my state senator uh, Liz Kruger, and I want to thank uh, the my co-prime sponsor on this legislation, uh, Councilmember Mark Levine. Uh, who is carrying introduction uh, number 1603, which I am also proud to be his co-prime sponsor on, and together we can make things better for our tenants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Kellos. Thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, my colleagues and friend, Councilmember Levin, to talk about his bill, introductory bill number 1603. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Eugene. And as you mentioned, I am pleased to be co-sponsoring intro number 1603 with my co-lead sponsor, Ben Kalos, uh, concerning the use of credit history as a determinant for who can enter affordable housing subsidized by our city. You know, when most members of the public hear this term, credit bureau, they hear bureau, they think, Oh, that sounds like an official government agency, like maybe the Bureau of Engraving. Public needs to understand 
Credit bureaus are for-profit companies. Their customers are not you and me. Their customers are the businesses that they are selling these histories to. And it is not surprising that with that profit motive, they are often peddling mistaken histories about regular people, about consumers, and, and about people who are applying for affordable housing in New York City. And that is why we have been act actively pushing to reduce the degree to which these credit histories, which can be faulty, and even when accurate, can simply reflect that someone has been through economic distress. We don't want that blocking anyone out of affordable housing. Since we have started working on this issue, I am pleased that HBD has begun to reduce its reliance on this measure, but we are pushing for a comprehensive solution that ensures that we don't undermine the mission of affordable housing by excluding the very people who are in greatest economic need. Today, a person who, for example, has lost their job and has accumulated, let's say, $6,000 in consumer debt and has judgments against them, has lost their home, has landed in a homeless shelter, they would not be protected in the changes that HPD has made thus far to the way that it considers credit history and the guidelines given to affordable housing developers. Our bill would fix that. Our bill, intro 1603, would ensure that credit history, even in the case of consumer judgments, even for people who are not currently housed and don't have rent history, that this credit history will not block them from the affordable housing that our taxpayers are subsidized. And I'm very pleased that we'll be hearing this bill today, and I want to thank the chair for his leadership on this and many other matters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Levin. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have been uh, joined by Councilmember Brad Lender. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now we are going, I think we are going to call the Now we are going to call the advocates. Uh, we are going to, they are going to testify on the introductory bill 1682. You want to call them? Okay, uh, Catherine Cohen. From Lambda Legal and Matthew Shoker. Okay, I hope that I pronounce it right. And uh, er Eric Lesh from LGBT Bar Association of New York. Thank you. Thank you very much. You may start, please, before you start, state your name. Good morning. There we go. Um, <clears throat> Civil and Human Rights Committee, thank you for having me. My name is Matthew Shurka. I am a born and raised New Yorker, a constitu constituent of Speaker Corey Johnson's district, a survivor of conversion therapy, and the co-founder of Born Perfect. Born Perfect is a legal campaign to protect LGBTQ people from the discredited and harmful practice of conversion therapy. We are educating those who still believe being LGBTQ is an illness. I've had the privilege to lead a movement that is unprecedented. Ending conversion therapy by legislative means and litigation only began a decade ago. No such laws or lawsuits have ever existed before, and I am proud to share the success of our, uh, <coughs> sorry, and I'm proud to share the success of our work alongside the hundreds of elected officials who have either sponsored or voted in favor of passing such legis legislation nationwide. For the first time in my career, I am testifying in favor of repealing one of those laws. 
the New York City Conversion Therapy Ordinance, subchapter 19 of chapter five of Title 20 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York. Since 2012, our team has supported the passage of legislation in 18 states and 55 municipalities. At every step, we have tried to be as strategic as possible because the stakes of this issue are high. We know that conversion therapy is a life-threatening practice, and we know that those who endorse and promote it, including anti-LGBT hate groups, will fight hard to oppose us as part of their campaign to stigmatize LGBT people and portray us as deviant and mentally ill. Not surprisingly, we have faced legal challenges to the laws from these groups and from conversion therapists who want to continue to prey on our community by falsely claiming they can change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. So far, all of these legal challenges have failed and these life-saving laws have been upheld in California, New Jersey, Illinois, and Florida. Now for New York. I began advocating for a New York statewide law in 2013. The first introduction of such a bill was in 2014 by Assemblywoman Glick and State Senator Brad Hoyleman. But then the legislative process stalled. For several years, our statewide bill was blocked and could not receive a vote on the Senate floor in Albany. In 2017, we began to advocate for a New York City law and Council Member Drome um, was the sponsor on that. Since New York City does not have the legal power to regulate licensed mental health professionals, the law that was introduced and passed on the basis of consumer fraud in the Consumer Affairs Department, which we believe was the best course of action at that time and was the only such law in the nation. Since the 2017 New York City law passed, a new understanding for how to protect LGBTQ people has emerged. We have learned that LGBTQ victims of conversion therapy fraud can sue their therapists under existing consumer fraud laws in every state. In the lawsuit, Michael Ferguson v. Jonah and Kate McCaw v. Wiley, victims of conversion therapy in New Jersey and California sued their respective conversion therapists and won on the basis of consumer fraud. Here we are in 2019. Uh, in January, the New York legislature passed a statewide law protecting LGBTQ minors from being subjected to conversion therapy by licensed professionals. This was a long awaited success for our New York youth. It was soon after that that I and other state and national organizations began discussing with Speaker Corey Johnson about repealing the New York City law. We saw the law being challenged by anti-LGBT group in the, in the case Schwartz v. City of New York. And we know firsthand how much time and resources such litigation can take. Based on the successful consumer fraud lawsuits that I noted, we also understood that the New York City law is redundant and of, of existing consumer fraud protections under state and local laws, so that repealing it will not reduce any existing protections. We understood that while the New York City law is valid and should be upheld, there's always a risk of loss in any litigation, and that such a loss might well be seen as undermining laws in other states. For all these reasons, we strongly support repeal as the most responsible and protective decision, the one that will best protect LGBTQ people, both in New York and other states, and that will best support the nationwide campaign to end conversion therapy. I am grateful to Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership and support I am grateful to Councilmember Drome for his leadership and tireless work to support our community when he first introduced this law in 2017, and I am proud of the city I call home. I just want to add, um, as I wrap that up, um, with all of that, and thank you for that time, I am a conversion therapy survivor, and from age 16 to 21, I was treated here in New York City by licensed professionals treating my condition and illness that they described as SSA, 
SSA stands for same sex attraction. I was separated from my mother and sisters for three years. I was not allowed to speak to any females so that I understood the roles of females and males as described by a licensed professional. The irreversible harm that is done to me and my family um, as a 31 year old now is only something I'm still recovering from and I deal with every day and that is something I will carry. And as a proud leader in this campaign, um, I am a victim to what are the, th the, the practices that happened here in New York. My family additionally did spend $35,000 on my conversion therapy, even though it harmed us deeply. And so I was frauded from a consumer point of view. I was misguided by licensed professionals here in this state. And so I'm proud that I worked on introducing the, uh, working with uh, Council Member Jerome in introducing this law. And I am very proud that we now have a greater understanding of how to protect LGBTQ people here in the city and the state in supporting a repeal for this law. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my, I'm sorry, no. my name is Catherine Cohen, and I'm an attorney with Lambda Legal here in New York City. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of the proposal to repeal the city's ordinance banning the sale of conversion therapy. First, I want to thank this committee and the council as a whole for your commitment to addressing the needs of the LGBTQ population in New York City and for taking up this important matter. I am here to express Lambda Legal's strong support for the council's bill to repeal this ordinance. It is the collective understanding of advocates working to promote LGBTQ and civil rights, including Lambda Legal, the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and the Southern Poverty Law Center, that this is the best course of action to protect conversion therapy laws across the country. Nearly 700,000 adults in the U.S. have been subjected to conversion therapy at some point in their lives, with half of those being in their adolescence. As a result of statewide laws in 18 states, an estimated 10,000 LGBTQ youth have been protected from experiencing this life-threatening practice. Lambda Legal supported the ordinance, which made clear that the sale of conversion therapy is fraudulent, when it was enacted by the City Council in 2017. At that time, there was no statewide express protections against this harmful practice. The city took action when the state would not. Earlier this year, the state took the necessary step of passing a law that protects LGBTQ minors throughout the state. Additionally, in the last two years, several lawsuits have shown that consumer fraud laws are an additional and powerful remedy against this harmful practice. Throughout New York, minors are now protected by the state's new law. Everyone else is protected and has recourse by virtue of the state and the city's robust consumer protections, which exist independently of this ordinance. We applaud the city's leadership in spurring a statewide law and in taking the strategic step to avoid baseless yet potentially damaging litigation. We thank the city and the Civil, right, Civil and Human Rights Committee and urge the passion of this motion. Thank you very much for our testimony. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the proposal to repeal the city's ordinance banning conversion therapy. I'm particularly um, proud to be sitting up here next to some very um, strong advocates, particularly Matthew for his courageous work around the country to end conversion therapy. There is no stronger advocate in my opinion, so it is, um, it's an honor to be sitting up here at the table with you and thank you for the time. My name is Eric Lesh. I'm the executive director of the LGBT Bar Association of Greater New York. We are one of the oldest LGBT bar associations in the country. We serve nearly 2,000 LGBT low-income New Yorkers every year through our legal clinic and our helpline. We also have a clinic that serves LGBTQ youth uh, here in New York City. And uh, I'm, I'm here testifying not just on behalf of the LGBT bar, but my words reflect um, the uh, sentiments of a, a several other leading advocates in the civil and human rights space uh, that have worked for years to end conversion therapy, not just in New York, but across the country. Those groups include the National Center for Lesbian Rights, the Southern Poverty Law Center, Lambda Legal, and the Mattachine Society. We speak with a single voice on this issue, Repealing this ordinance is the right thing to do, and now is the right time to do it. At the outset, um, when this ordinance was passed in 2017, 
There was no state law expressly prohibiting the sale of conversion therapy here in New York. New York had considered but had not enacted legislation to protect minors from conversion therapy. The city's decision to move forward with a ban at that time uh, in light of the state's failure to act was timely, was strategic, and it was bold. In our estimation, the city's action helped elevate the discussion of why conversion therapy is so harmful and highlighted why uh, this is a dangerous practice and the state needed to act right away. That law um, that the state passed just this year now provides protections for LGBTQ minors across New York State. Other things have changed since the enactment of this ordinance, as my colleagues have brought up. Lawsuits filed by the National Center for Lesbian Rights, by the Southern Poverty Law Center, have shown that consumer protection laws that exist here in the city and across the state are just as effective at protecting uh, adults and minors from the harmful fraud of conversion therapy. Just this past June, for example, a lawsuit filed by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, a judge in New York City confirmed that the organization that was peddling conversion therapy was a fraud. Um, they promised a cure for being gay. Um, they had to dissolve and cease all operation, and the judge ordered them to pay $3.5 million in attorney's fees. That organization will never practice conversion therapy in the state of New Jersey again. New York has similar laws here. Meanwhile, social science continues to demonstrate the extreme dangers of conversion therapy. Just this month, for example, a study published by the Journal of American Medicine found that for transgender people, exposure to conversion therapy doubles the rate of suicide attempts. A study by the Family Acceptance Project released last November found that when parents send their LGBT children to conversion therapy, they triple the risk of suicide attempts. The study concluded that 63% of young people sent by their parents to conversion therapy attempt suicide. 63%. This alarming research confirms that advocates and policymakers must redouble their efforts, not just here in New York, but across the country, enacting city ordinances, statewide laws to ban this harmful practice. That is why, right now, the national and local LGBTQ groups that we represent here at this table in, in, in the city who have also voiced their support are unanimous in praising the city council, the speaker, for their uh, repeal of this ordinance. Throughout the state, minors are protected by state law. Everyone else is, is protected by consumer fraud statutes. The ordinance has become, over time, duplicative and in the face of litigation, unnecessary. Repealing this ordinance now avoids the cost of risk of litigation and allows the city to focus and redouble its efforts and other resources on LGBTQ communities at risk. It shows that the city is a strategic partner in the work to not just p prevent uh, people in New York from the harmful practice of conversion therapy, but our efforts to eradicate it from, from the nation. Um, so we thank the city, we thank the Civil and Human Rights Committee, and we urge passage of this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony, and thank you to all the members of the panel. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank you. Now I want to call the next panel, the members of the next panel. Uh, Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner of uh, New York City Human Rights. Yeah. Oh, the commissioners, thank you. So let me just uh, make sure that I uh, make a clarification. We have with us uh, the commissioner, not the deputy commissioner, because somebody put deputy commissioner. No, I apologize. Deputy commissioner. All right. So now we want to call uh, Margaret Brown from HPD. Thank you very much. Before you start, will you please state your names? And you can start. 
pain assessment. Hold on, please. Mm -hmm. We're just going to do the oath. Oh, yes. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Eugene and committee members. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing on intros 85 and 1603, two important bills in the city's effort to address housing discrimination and access to housing. Before I speak on the bills, I'll highlight some of the Commission's efforts to combat housing discrimination. They are more robust than ever. In January 2018, the Commission established its Source of Income Unit, a small dedicated unit of staff special specifically focused on both, intermediate Im on both immediate interventions and large-scale systemic prosecutions to combat source of income discrimination, in which individuals with housing vouchers, including Section 8, City FEPS, HASA, or other forms of rental subsidies are turned away by landlords who refuse to accept them, which has been a violation of the city human rights law since 2008. Since the inception of the Source of Income Unit, the unit has resolved 236 cases through pre-complaint intervention, securing housing for housing insecure and homeless New Yorkers after being turned away by a housing provider because of their voucher, allowing a tenant to remain in their home through the use of a voucher, getting a voucher restored or extended, or delaying or preventing an eviction. In addition to responding immediately to critically urgent cases, the unit also files complaints against housing providers where appropriate, particularly where pre-complaint intervention does not resolve the matter, where a housing provider has repeatedly violated the law, or where a systemic pattern or practice issue is identified. The Commission resolved a case earlier this year that is demonstrative of its comprehensive efforts to combat source of income discrimination. The case involved a prospective tenant who alleged that respondent, the owner of three buildings containing affordable units, refused to accept complainant SEP, um, SEP's voucher and denied her housing application. After the complaint was filed, respondent promptly expressed a desire to resolve the, ca the case and cooperated fully in the Commission's investigation. However, the Commission's investigation revealed that respondent had an unlawful policy of refusing to accept such vouchers and that at least two individuals, including complainant and likely more, had been denied pursuant to that policy. The Commission complainant and respondent entered into a conciliation agreement requiring respondent to pay emotional distress damages to complainant um, and damages for loss of housing opportunity in addition to civil penalties to the general fund of the City of New York. Respondent also agreed to adopt policies not only to change their policy with respect to vouchers, but also regarding broadly tenant screening, reasonable accommodations for tenants with disabilities, and the use of criminal history information in making housing decisions. To train all employees with managerial authority or with job duties related to reviewing applications on compliance with the city human rights law, and to post the commission's fair housing poster in all buildings that they, um, they own in New York City. In addition to the commission's targeted efforts to combat source of income discrimination, the commission's work to address housing discrimination across all protected categories, including race, immigration status, national origin, disability, and others, involves several creative strategies. The Commission's Project Equal Access continues to advocate for accommodations for people with disabilities in housing through its pre-complaint resolution efforts, achieving 174 such resolutions in fiscal year 2019, up from fiscal year 2018. Project Equal Access remains a key program of the Commission in its focus to resolve matters for members of the public as expeditiously as possible and without litigation where appropriate. Project Equal Access de deploys specialized staff at the Commission to work directly with landlords and other housing providers to create physical modifications and other accommodations to allow people with disabilities to remain in their homes, improve access to common spaces and entrances and exits, and ensure that people can live with their service animals and or emotional support animals. In fiscal year 2019, the Commission resolved a groundbreaking first-of-its-kind case against a landlord based on its use of criminal history to screen out applicants using the, le the legal theory relying on 2016 HUD guidance and national statistics that such a policy has a disproportionate impact on black and Latinx prospective tenants. In another groundbreaking resolution, the commission earlier this year resolved a case involving a large housing provider that owns approximately over 8,000 units that failed to reasonably accommodate a tenant's use of a wheelchair by refusing his repeated requests over several years to widen a bathroom door and install a roll-in shower in his apartment and to make the building's entrance accessible. After the Law Enforcement Bureau investigated and issued a probable cause determination, 
the parties entered into a conciliation agreement requiring the housing provider to revise its anti-discrimination policies, create a website, the first of its kind as part of a conciliation agreement with the commission, that is specifically designed to be accessible to individuals with disabilities and includes information about how to request reasonable accommodations from the housing provider, conduct anti-discrimination training for all employees, display the commission's Know Your Rights postings, and pay the complainant $160,000 in emotional distress damages, the highest emotional distress damages award to date in a housing action at the commission. As further relief negotiated under the settlement, the housing provider installed automatic entrance and mailroom doors throughout the four buildings of the housing complex to make the entire complex physically accessible to individuals with mobility impairments. Turning now to the two proposed bills, First, intro 85 would make it a protected category under the New York City Human Rights Law to discriminate in housing based on a prospective or current tenant's inclusion on a quote tenant blacklist, i.e. tenant screening lists that are used to identify supposedly risky tenants by naming tenants, excuse me, risky renters by naming tenants who have been involved in a housing court case. The bill adds participating in a housing court proceeding to the list of protected categories in the housing discrimination section of the City Human Rights Law. Since Intro 85 was drafted and introduced, there have been legislative changes at the state level that prohibiting the use of tenant blacklists as a screening tool for prospective tenants. As um, Councilmember Kalos noted, Real Property Law Section 227-F empowers the Attorney General to civilly prosecute landlords who continue to use these lists. The administration and the commission look forward to working with the council to consider ways that the city can strengthen these protections by considering the possibility of a private right of action under city law and using the commission as a venue. Intro 1603 would make it, unlawful, make it an unlawful discriminatory practice to deny a rental or lease of a housing accommodation controlled or subsidized or both by HPD based on prohibited indicators of credit. As my colleague at HPD will explain in further detail, since this bill was introduced, HPD updated its marketing guidelines to allow an applicant the choice to avoid a, a credit check by providing evidence of 12 months com of complete rent payments. In the Commission's experience, housing providers regularly use credit history as an arbitrary basis for rejecting qualified applicants who are demonstrably able to pay their rent on time. Some housing providers, for example, have rejected applicants based on their credit history even where 100% of the rent will be covered by a housing voucher. The Commission prosecutes such cases now as discrimination based on lawful source of income. However, we believe that additional protections along the lines of those proposed in this bill can help to remove unnecessary impediments to housing in our city. The Commission, along with our partners at HPD and others within the administration, look forward to working with the Council on these critical issues to reduce barriers to stable and affordable and safe housing across New York City. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Would you please uh, start? Good morning, Chair Eugene and Hello. members of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. I am Margaret Brown, Associate Commissioner for Housing Opportunity and Program Services. This is my first time testifying in front of the Civil and Human Rights Committee, and I'm excited for the opportunity to explain a bit more about our work. Affordable housing is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face, and correspondingly, it is one of the top priorities of Mayor de Blasio's administration. Our housing lottery process is a vital way to connect New Yorkers to the affordable homes we are producing at a record pace. It is no secret that there is a housing crisis in New York City. Although we now have the largest housing stock on record, the city's vacancy, remains, the city's vacancy rate remains low at 3.63%. Building on our successes during the first few years of this administration, we accelerated and expanded our housing plan to achieve 300,000 affordable homes by 2026 and released Housing New York 2.0, a suite of new programs, partnerships, and strategies to help thousands more families and seniors afford their rent, buy a first home, and stay in the neighborhoods they love. As a result, five years into the plan, we have established a new baseline for how affordable housing can, can and should be built in New York City. Already, this administration has financed over 135,000 affordable apartments through fiscal year FY19, 57,000 of which serve low-income individuals making less than roughly 36,500 per year, or 47,000 for a family of three. 
As we accelerate and expand the goals of Housing New York, we are also looking to speed up the delivery of affordable housing we are producing and ensure those homes serve the New Yorkers who need them most. Housing Connect, the city's affordable housing lottery system, allows New Yorkers to search for affordable housing, fill out a profile, and apply for multiple homes with a few clicks of a button. Since launching in 2013 through December 2018, over 2.2 million people have made accounts on Housing Connect, 1.2 million have submitted applications, and 23,000 households have, have moved into new homes. Now, six years after this revolutionary application was created, HPD is currently building a new and improved Housing Connect 2.0 system to launch next year, which will include an even friendlier user experience. In order to make New York the fairest big city in America, HPD also updated our mar marketing policies that develop developers must follow to further limit how credit history impacts housing applicants, address and clarify complexities in income calculations, ensure special protections for survivors of domestic violence, and make the lottery selection process more efficient. Just last month, we also rolled out new policies to reduce the chances of a tenant being denied due to poor credit history, with the introduction of the option for applicants to provide 12 months positive rental payment history rather than a landlord-initiated credit check. The change also paves the, paves the way for applicants to apply for affordable housing without the need to provide a social security number or an individual taxpayer identification number for every adult in the household. The policy updates also lower credit check fees to sync with the new state rent laws, which limit credit and background check fees to $20 per application, and lets applicants avoid credit check fees altogether by providing a recent credit check to the landlord. Further, HPD updated our policies to align with the recent state New York, New York State Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which no longer allows housing court history to be considered when evaluating a potential tenant in any New York apartment. These updates demonstrate the city's continued commitment to create more opportunities for all New Yorkers. Importantly, developers must also meet all of the steps outlined in the published marketing requirements before they are able to go forward with selecting applicants. HPD has been very focused on expanding our existing outreach tools and education efforts. We currently have a robust communication requirement during the marketing process, including, but not limited to, outreach to local community boards, elected officials, and the general public through on online and print advertisements, both citywide and local. Understanding that some may find applying for, for affordable projects to be complicated, HPD provides resources to lottery applicants in a variety of ways. Besides hosting bi-weekly marketing seminars for potential lottery applicants to teach them about the process, our Housing Ambassador Program partners with community-based service providers such as Impact Brooklyn or the Mutual Housing Association of New York who help individuals prepare and even apply for affordable housing lotteries. We've also conducted Housing Ambassador training for council staff at both 100 Gold and in district offices and are always looking for more opportunities for this partnership. HPD and the Department of Consumer and Worker Protections Ready to Rent initiative, supported by the Council, also provides free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling and assistance with affordable housing applications. And our resource fairs, marketing seminars, and mobile van continue to allow us to assist New Yorkers directly in their communities. Thanks to the City Council, we've been able to translate the application guides into 17 languages. With this robust and aggressive work in mind, we appreciate the Council's shared goal to increase access to our lottery system. We thank C Council Members Kalos and Levine for their leadership in application process, and we are happy to discuss further Introductions 85 and 1603, which codify many existing practices in place due to rent recent policy changes by HPD or the passage of the New York State Housing and Stability Tenant Protection Act of 2019 to ensure that any future legislation matches these recent changes. We would also be interested in discussing Intro 1603 further, thinking about how it could be implemented to more than just HPD financed projects. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I will take any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, thank you. Before I proceed with the question, I want 
to give my to my colleague Levine the opportunity to ask questions because he has to leave. Will you please Thank you so much, me? Mr. Chair, for that accommodation, and, and great to see both of you. Um, Commissioner, I know you share our belief that the point of affordable housing is to serve people who are in the greatest economic need. And the goal of this legislation is to make sure we don't leave people behind in fulfilling that mission. Um, I want to clarify, then, what is the minimum credit score cutoff for folks seeking city-funded affordable housing? Uh, is it 500 or is it 580? So applicants cannot be rejected on the basis of credit score at all. Um, in the, uh, at, when we first implemented uh, credit restrictions, restrictions on developers, um, use of credit screening criteria, one of the um, pieces of feedback we had uh, was that credit score is an efficiency measure. And so we left in the guidelines the opportunity for a developer to say, anyone over, it, and the cutoff here is 580 for um, an uh, applicant to the lottery, 500 for an applicant to, um, that comes through our homeless set-aside referral process. Um, but th that option to say, um, with that score, I'm just moving forward. I'm not taking a deeper dive into what drives that score at all. And that score, um, the 580, really represents um, what is uh, the um, uh, kind of lower end of um, satisfactory credit. Bef uh, the 579 is poor credit, so it's really pretty a low, a pretty low bar. But a developer, if they want to use that as an efficiency measure, um, can say anyone 580 or above. I'm just accepting without looking at anything else in their credit history. But no applicant can be rejected based on credit score. I just want to understand then, someone in a homeless shelter with a credit score below 500. The developer has to take a deeper dive into what's behind that credit score. One of the things we learned as we started looking at credit scores is that credit scores vary widely um, based on the credit information reported by the three bureaus, but also on the credit scoring system. Applicants can actually have over 1,000 credit scores. Um, based on different kind of the matrix of the, all the different scoring systems that are available and then the three bureaus as well. Um, and so we, we really um, don't uh, want to rely on credit score, particularly where an applicant is at risk of being rejected. So we require that the developer take a deeper look into the credit to say what's driving that score. Um, and then there are very restrictive criteria, um, uh, restrictive on the developer, um, that can be used um, to actually reject somebody. Uh, one of the ones that you referenced in your, tes in your opening statement was um, uh, uh, delinquencies. And I want to make clear that those are um, currently open many judgments um, in excess of $5,000 is um, one of the uh, remaining criteria that is currently in the guidelines. Right, and, and, and therein lies the problem from our perspective that there are still people for whom, though this may not absolutely close the door, uh, would, would negatively prejudice their prospects of getting housing. Um, that could mean people remain in the homeless sh shelter system longer than they otherwise would. Could mean people that are not in the shelter system land there because um, for them the cutoff is a little bit higher, 580. Um, we're seeking to close that loophole. Uh, we're seeking to make sure that the lowest income New Yorkers, um, who are obviously going to be far more likely to have judgments against them, to have delinquencies, and to have low credit scores, um, don't face higher barriers than other New Yorkers. Um, and uh, uh, th that, that remains our motivation behind the bill. I know you share the motivation. It sounds like our dispute is on, on, on just how much of a factor we're uh, comfortable with this being. Um, my answer would be, it shouldn't be a factor. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that you're looking for nuance. Um, my fear is that that nuance could still tilt uh, in disfavor for the people who are most in need. Sure. So um, I, I appreciate the chance to discuss this with you. I apologize um, that I have to, to leave, but I do thank the chair for this uh, accommodation and thank you for bringing this to the hearing today. Thank you very much also, Councilmember Levin, for your advocacy, and thank you so very much, 
for all the wonderful do uh, job you're doing on behalf of the people of New York. Thank you so much. And I do just want to say, Council Member, as you're walking out, that we look forward to working with you on this. We really want to um, make sure that this bill is um, implemented with maximum impact. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, you know, we know in New York City, New York City is a very complex city. Many of us, we are blessed and fortunate. We can understand the system. We can navigate. But the majority, a good number of people in New York City, they don't even know even their right when their right have been violated. They don't know that. They, they are work, they're hardworking people. They spend hours to go to work, to provide for their children, to bring food on the table. We need their minds. And not on, uh, you know, uh, 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 regulations. They don't know how to stand for the right. They don't know when to start stand for the right. What uh, the Human Rights Commission has in place to inform those people, to educate them, to let them know, hey, you know what? You have a right. And if your right have been violated, this is what you have to do. This is what we have available for you. What the, the Bureau has uh, in place to help those people? Because all of us, all the uh, citizens, uh, constituents, and New Yorkers, they all, we all have the same rights. They're entitled also uh, to the benefit that uh, the Human Rights Commission has in place. Sure. Um, so our, our approach is sort of multi-pronged. We have um, a team from our Community Outreach Bureau that, um, you know, our, our staff, right now at the latest count speaks over 30 different languages. We are out in the five boroughs every single day. I think we're gonna be, um, our agency will be with you, I think today, today. later today, um, for a, a Caribbean Communities event. Um, we are, uh, we partner and leverage our, our relationships with agencies like HPD and, um, and Department of Social Services um, to provide information to New Yorkers who are um, housing unstable or um, looking for housing to know what their rights are. We also um, take very seriously our obligation to inform entities that have obligations under the city human rights law. We recognize that people are battling bureaucracy and a lot of different challenges and so it should not always be on the, the individuals who are ex, you know who, who may experience discrimination to understand and advocate for their rights but that the entities that have responsibilities and obligations under the city human rights law know what they are and know that they have to comply with them so we work with um, housing providers both large and small um, real estate entities um, again, our sister agencies that have housing stock to ensure that we know what's happening on the ground, that landlords and other housing providers know what their obligations are, and we provide you know, literature, resources, um, rapid response um, as necessary to um, make sure that people access the housing that they're entitled to. Yes, uh, I just want to take the opportunity also to commend the Human Rights Commission, yourself and the commission and all this stuff for for the outreach they are doing in the community. Yes, today you will be in my district reaching out to people from all ethnic background. As a matter of fact, I'll be there. Yes. And I, I appreciate also one of the person who is working uh, on this project, and she lives in my district, and she was very aggressive asking me to translate, you know, the, the flyer to other languages. Thank you so very much. Thank you. But uh, we are talking about reaching out the the uh, the tenants are the people, but we know that uh, there are two sides of the of the situation. At the same time, as we are trying to educate and to to reach out to the tenant, what about the landlord? What the commission has in place to educate them, to make awareness, to let them know that hey guys, there are rules and regulation, there are do's and don'ts. You know, as the landlord, you cannot do this, you cannot do that. If you do this, you do that, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. We don't want to, to, to put you in trouble and to, to give you a hard time, but this is the law. If you do that, you're going to be in trouble. 
we'll have to apply the law because the tenant has the right. What do you have in place to educate the landlord also mm -hmm. and to help them understand that they think they should not do? Because one of the things, there are people who do stuff. They're in trouble with uh, the law because they don't even, I'm not talking about those landlords. I've said some of the time, people may do something, they may not know what they are doing. I don't say this is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the general situation for the landlord, but I'm talking in general. Some people, I'm talking about people who are not aware of certain rules and regulations, they may commit you know, a crime without knowing. But let me put it, uh, come back to the landlord. So now, just to ensure that the landlord, they know also what they should not do, what do you have in place? Um, so we have um, workshops and um, educational opportunities for landlords, for brokers, for people with access to housing stock um, that we, and we regularly partner with different either business entities, um, community boards, um, again, housing providers, both large and small, to provide these resources. We also, through our enforcement efforts, work to provide education. So if we learn that a housing provider is um, unaware of the law, we provide information to that housing provider, to that landlord, so that they will not violate the law again. We have a challenge in, in that we want to ensure that people get the housing they are entitled to as quickly as possible. Um, so. Instead, in lieu of filing complaints in certain situations, we will do some pre-complaint advocacy to place that individual in housing with that landlord. However, if we see that that landlord violates the law again, once they've been made aware of the, their obligations under the city human rights law, we will, again, advocate to get that individual into housing, but then file a complaint and, um, and challenge that landlord's systemic practices and make sure that um, their policies and practices are changed. They may be subject to civil penalties. The person who's turned away may be subject to emotional distress damages or loss of ho housing opportunity damages. Um, and we also use our enforcement efforts to send a message to large providers that they cannot violate the law with impunity, that the commission is an active and engaged enforcement agency, and we will um, use our enforcement tools for maximum impact and go after large entities um, to have the broadest impact that we have. So we use both an educational model and also an enforcement model to, um, to spread the, the word about the commission's enforcement efforts and, um, and the requirements under the city human rights law. How many cases the commission handles every year? Case of discrimination. Sure. So we, um, our MMR numbers just came out, I believe, yesterday, um, and our intakes into the commission through um, phone calls, through email inquiries, or you know, walk-ins into our offices was close to ten thousand last year. That's about ninety-eight hundred. Um, we filed close to eight hundred complaints, but we also. Um, shifted many of those cases that would otherwise be complaints into pre-complaint interventions to respond more quickly. So last year we resolved nearly 600 cases through pre-complaint intervention and we closed um, over 900 cases that had been filed as complaints. Um, so we have a lot of data um, around our, our latest numbers from fiscal year 2019. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I know that uh, um, you, in the Human Rights Commission, you are trying to reach out people, to advocate people, to prevent, to prevent you know, uh, uh, cases of discrimination. What are the challenges that you are facing? I think the challenge is um, our system is set up in a way that um, creates, there, there are challenges to the process. So. Um, the commission is, our process is dictated by statute and it's dictated by our rules of practice. Um, mm -hmm. The commission just underwent a several year long review um, and notice and comment to update our rules of practice for the first time since 1998 to address, um, to build in more efficiencies into our process. But our process can be lengthy for that reason. We are an investigative and litigation body, um, so we 
um, serve complaints on respondents, they have certain amounts of time to respond, they get extensions to respond. We want to ensure that both parties are at the table and aware of what's happening. And that can take some time. Investigations can take some time. One of the reasons why we've created new specialized units, a pre-complaint intervention unit, a source of income unit, um, a gender-based harassment unit, is to address immediate concerns that aren't well situated to go through a lengthy litiga investigation litigation process. So I think, as I've discussed previously at other hearings, we are always working to be as nimble and as flexible and as creative as possible to, um, to address the immediate needs of New Yorkers with the recognition that some cases will go through a full complaint and investigation process and others will could potentially be resolved through some telephone advocacy or um, sending letters or other forms of pre-complaint um, action. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Brown, um, in terms of you know uh, outreach, you know conducted by HPD, so what can you tell us about the outreach? Are you the HPD? reach out the people in the community to let them know about the assistance or the program available, you know, in HPD in order to help them, you know, facing the housing discrimination cases. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the specific to um, housing discrimination and um, uh, the new, particularly the new tenant protection laws, um, there's really kind of uh, two pieces. One is how those laws apply to um, affordable housing mm -hmm. and um, the affordable housing lotteries. Um, we, we have updated our guidelines and um, created materials um, uh, for education surrounding that, both for landlords and tenants. Um, particularly toward the, the landlord side um, in the in HPD housing where we are specifically op overseeing that housing and overseeing the rental of those units um, is, uh, is somewhat easier for us because we have actual oversight and enforcement um, on those units as they are being rented so we can see the, the ensure that the um, landlords are using uh, the marketing guidelines that we have. Um, and then in terms of outreach to applicants to affordable housing, um, we have uh, both our own team um, from HPD does about two seminars in communities per week. We did over 100 last year um, around uh, the affordable housing application process and, um, and particularly the, the, uh, the policies around that by which um, applicants can and cannot be screened. Um, and also, we have what we call our Housing Ambassadors Program, where we train local community organizations to uh, help to educate the public and their constituents in um, affordable housing uh, lottery process, in policies, yeah. and more broadly in policies um, that affect tenants. Um, that said, outside of just what applies to affordable housing lotteries, HPD is working clo closely with the new uh, Mayor's Office of Tenant Protections to develop a broad-scale campaign around the new um, tenant protection laws um, to make sure that both okay. tenants and landlords are fully informed of their rights and obligations under those new protections. Thank you very much. Uh, talking about outreach, but we know that New York City is, uh, is home to so many people. And many of them, you know, in English is not the primary language, you know, and they are not only they have a, you know, social, cultural barrier, but l the language may be a barrier too. And they're, they're more comfortable, not comfortable, but they get more when they deal with their own people, uh, you know, or using their own languages. What uh, do you have in terms of, you know, languages, you know, staff speaking other languages to reach out to other people? Absolutely. So our... Um, our, all of the materials for the affordable housing um, lottery process are translated into, uh, the, the system itself is translated into seven languages in addition to English. Um, uh, we have uh, all of the materials on how to apply translated into an additional 10 languages on top of that. Um, and one of our key tools is really the housing ambassadors. Um, we have housing ambassadors uh, that I believe serve about 20 different languages. 
Um, we currently have 50 housing ambassadors across the city um, and are constantly looking to grow that program and training new ambassadors all the time. Those ambassadors are in communities across the city um, so that applicants can really be served in the language that they need and in their own communities. What can you tell us about uh, the access to HPD control of subsidized housing? Uh, people in the community, if they want to get, to get access to those, you know, uh, 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 HPD housing, what can you tell us about that? Uh, what is the process? Absolutely. And uh, the people who don't know about the process, is there anything in place also to educate people, to let them know, you know what, you can get access to those uh, uh, housing opportunities? Sure. I, again, in terms of education, um, both our own team uh, that runs the affordable housing lottery process um, does uh, two to three uh, information sessions for the public in communities every single week. Um, again, we did uh, over 100 last year and are on pace to do even more than that this year. Um, but really, the Housing Ambassador Program is really um, the best extension of our education efforts um, in that those are organizations that already sit in communities, already help people apply for affordable housing, and we train those organizations in the affordable housing lottery process so that they um, know the exact uh, um, qualification standards that people need, they know how to use Housing Connect, they can help people in that process, um, and again, they can serve people in multiple languages. Uh, the Deputy commission, Commissioner Sussman and Ms. Brown, I want to thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you so very much for what you have done. Thank, thank you. you. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. And I want to take a pause for five minutes. I'll be back right now because okay. I got to go to the okay. Committee of Aging that I'm a member also. They are having uh, a public, you know, public hearing also. I'll be back right now. I'm sorry about that.
All right. So let me take the opportunity to thank you for your patience. And we're going to resume the hearing now. Let me call the next panel. Robert Desir. I would say Robert Desir. <laughs> All right. Pleasure to see you. Uh, James uh, Fishman. From Fishman Law PC. And let me mention also that Robert Desir is from Legal Aid Society. Lu Lucy Block from ANHD. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. You may start any time. Uh, would you please state your name before you start? Looks like this microphone doesn't have power. Oh, oh, is it okay? Oh, there it is. Hello? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Robert Desir. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Chairperson Eugene and uh, the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Robert Desir, a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society, part of our housing practice. The Legal Aid Society commends the committees for holding this hearing today on these two bills, which prohibit the use of tenant blacklists and screening prospective tenants and prohibit the use of certain credit information in rental housing applications for apartments controlled or subsidized by HPD. These bills would prohibit the consideration of the credit history of anyone other than the tenant's designated representative and require key disclosures on the process and criteria for credit evaluation. The Legal Aid Society strongly supports the passage of both bills, which are long overdue and would ease access to affordable housing for numerous New Yorkers. With regard to intro 85, the practice of blacklisting tenants simply for appearing in housing court as a defendant is unjust and unfair. Landlords use tenant screening reports to target low-income tenants and prevent access to quality and affordable housing. TSB tenant screening bureau reports are often inaccurate, incomplete, or misleading. There are nearly 650 TSBs in the U.S. providing reports with information that may be different or incorrect. It's nearly impossible for consumers to ensure the accuracy of the report used by every landlord. In many cases, the reports only mention that the tenant was a defendant in housing court without providing any details. Even if a tenant prevails against their landlord in court, they're still often added to these screening reports and find themselves cut out by prospective landlords. This practice also has a chilling effect on tenants who withhold rent because they are not getting repairs from their landlords. It also doesn't account what happens in housing court. For example, these tenants who may take their landlord to court for um, these issues often get abatements, um, which vindicates their position. This is not reflected in those reports. Also, you have tenants who have to flee their homes for safety reasons and end up being sued by their landlords. This is also not reflected in those reports. Until recently, there was no state and there was minimal federal federal regulations on these tenant screening borough reports. So we applaud the City Council for taking action to um, address this issue and ensure fairness to um, tenants or prospective renters. 
Intro 1603 would prevent the consideration of a credit score, consumer debt judgment, collection action, or medical debt in the rental application of prospective tenants for apartments controlled or subsidized by the HPD and would ban consideration of the consumer credit history of anyone other than a designated household representative and require disclosure of the process and criteria by which the credit history will be evaluated. Credit scores are notoriously unreliable and regularly erroneous. A 2013 Federal Trade Commission study found one in five consumers have material errors on their credit reports. Other studies have shown that around 25% of credit reports contain serious errors that were enough to deny credit. Further, there are serious racial disparities in credit which should not be allowed to expand into determining who has access to affordable housing. The Legal Aid Society is regularly approached by consumers seeking assistance with errors on their credit reports that result in ec economic repercussions. The process of correcting a credit, credit report with the credit reporting bureaus is confusing, time consuming, and overly complicated for the average consumer. This task is far more difficult when the victim is an immigrant, a low income individual, or a member of another vulnerable community. Also, numerous consumers are victims of identity theft, which has an adverse impact on their credit scores and consequently their ability to obtain housing. These victims go through a vicious cycle where a single theft of their personal information leads to severe consequences and has a long-lasting impact on their ability to obtain credit. Finally, someone's medical history or personal medical information should not be included in considering a rental application. Medical debts incurred by a tenant or a tenant's relative for which the tenant remains liable in most cases has no bearing on the person's integrity or willingness to pay rent. Moreover, there are significant pri privacy concerns when prospective landlords have access to a person's medical history. It is critical to allow tenants who have faced hardship but are able to pay rent to have access to housing. So in conclusion, we um, thank the City Council for um, introducing these measures and taking action to address these issues. Um, we look forward to working with the council to um, push these bills forward and uh, pass them into law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Desir for Robert, for your testimony. Thank you. The next speaker, please. Good morning. My name is Lucy Block. Uh, I'm Good morning. I'm the Research and Policy Associate at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, ANHD. Thank you, Chair Eugene, for having this um, hearing today for the opportunity to testify. Um, ANHD builds community power to win affordable housing and thriving, equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. We're a coalition of community groups across New York City, and we use research, advocacy, and grassroots organizing to support our members in their work to build equity and justice in their neighborhoods and citywide. I'll be commenting today on intro uh, 85A. Um, I, in my written testimony, I commented on the original legislation. Um, I was pleased to see some of the changes in the amended legislation, um, so I'd like to revise my written testimony. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and give the relevant part of, of my testimony. Um, so ANHD enthusiastically supports making involvement in housing court a form of unlawful discrimination in housing accommodations. The tenant blacklist is an illegitimate and exploitative mechanism that systematically disempowers tenants. Landlords take tenants to court frivolously and abusively as a tactic to harass and remove them from their homes. This has overwhelmingly impacted people of color who face many layers of barriers to housing stability. For example, research by geographer and analyst Abe Salberg showed that the black population in a census tract was the highest predictor of eviction filings. After being targeted by a landlord and displaced via housing court, tenants on the blacklist face discrimination that adds additional obstacles to the already arduous search for decent and affordable housing. The mere existence of the tenant blacklist also undermines all tenant protections, discouraging any tenant for, from using the legal system to assert their rights. Whether they've been involved in housing court proactively or defensively, the blacklist places a scarlet letter on tenants' written records and prevents them from securing stable housing. So um, my original concern with the legislation was about the exception um, for tenants who, um, for cases where the tenant or tenants have not satisfied the terms of an order issued in such action or proceeding that was in the original legislation. So I'm pleased to see that that appears to have been removed from the amended legislation. Um, and the only remaining concern that I have is about the, um, the fees. Um, 
that are included, um, which I believe start at $100 per unit, um, which really don't seem to me to be um, a large enough disincentive to landlords to um, refrain from using tenant screening blacklists. I believe it's $100 per unit per month. Um, I, I can't see that being a disincentive for small landlords or large landlords. Um, and um, I saw that the commission will have some discretion in raising the amount of the fines, but I think that that minimum is really uh, way too low. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Eugene. My name is James Fishman. Uh, I'm a um, for the past 30 years, I have represented New York City tenants and consumers as an attorney in private practice. Uh, prior to that time, I served as, as an assistant attorney general in the Consumer Fraud and Protection Bureau, and, prior, and after that as a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society. Uh, my private practice over the last 30 years has consisted primarily of defending residential and commercial tenants from eviction and housing court. Uh, and in prosecuting individual and class action lawsuits in federal court against credit reporting agencies and debt collectors under the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, for the past 15 years, I have focused extensively on the problem of tenant blacklisting. Uh, as the nature of my practice, the two halves, the housing court half and the federal court half, uh, have literally come together uh, in the tenant blacklisting realm. Tenant blacklisting is a very serious and pervasive problem affecting virtually all residential tenants, regardless of where they live. In a nutshell, blacklisting occurs when a prospective landlord rejects an application from a prospective tenant because the applicant was sued by a previous landlord in a housing court proceeding <coughs> anywhere in the country, regardless of what the case was about and regardless of who prevailed in the case. Because blacklisting seriously impairs the ability of an individual to obtain residential housing, it is an issue that must be fully understood so that it can be prevented if possible or at least minimized. Over the past 15 years, my advocacy in this area has taken a variety of forms, including pursuing individual and class action suits against tenant screening bureaus for violation of the Fair Credit Reporting Act based upon inaccurate or incomplete reporting of housing court information about tenants, suing landlords in state supreme court to block them from even starting a housing court eviction proceeding that would result in blacklisting. And in that regard, we've now been able to obtain injunctions in about a dozen cases where courts have found that the mere filing of a housing court case creates immediate irreparable harm to a tenant because of blacklisting. And those judges have thus enjoined landlords from suing these tenants in the housing court and instead said to the landlord, you can litigate your eviction claim in the Supreme Court case. Now, obviously, that's not a widespread solution, but it does uh, illustrate uh, the, the, the nature and urgency of the problem. I even sued the Office of Court Administration in a uh, Section 1983 action alleging that the Office of Court Administration's issuance and sale of electronic data to the tenant screening companies facilitated the process and re uh, resulted in a uh, constitutional violation which chilled the rights of tenants to actually use the housing court. Um, so in my housing court advocacy, I have also endeavored wherever possible to convince landlord lawyers who were threatening to sue my clients in an eviction proceeding to name them only as John Doe or Jane Doe, and so as to keep their name out of housing court records altogether, which is really the only way to prevent blacklisting when a case is brought. Uh, as a result of those efforts over the past 15 years, tenants, landlords, landlord and tenant lawyers, and housing court judges have become much more attuned to the problem of tenant blacklisting and its causes and effects. Um, intro 85A represents a well-intentioned effort to solve the problem. However, it does have some significant flaws which should be recognized and addressed. And it must be emphasized that even if it is enacted with or without these flaws, the problem of tenant blacklisting will not disappear and in some cases will become more problematic. First, the bill essentially creates an administrative violation against a landlord that's enforceable by the Human Rights Commission. 
where a landlord denies an apartment simply because an applicant was a party to a housing court case. In the real world, however, savvy landlords know that they will have to come up with some other pretextual reason to deny an apartment to avoid liability. And there are many non-illegal reasons a landlord is permitted to use to deny an apartment that hides the fact that it was based on a prior housing court case. Although landlords are required to provide a written adverse action notice if an apartment is denied either in whole or in part because of a credit report, including a tenant screening bureau report, many landlords either ignore this requirement or they're unaware of it. Those landlords who are aware of the obligation and provide an adverse action notice use one that is drafted for them by the tenant screening bureau that they use. These companies provide a full service, including a form adverse action notice uh, so that the landlord simply has to click a box on their screen and it spits out that notice. But those notices do not identify any specific information in the credit report itself that caused the denial. Uh, specifically whether it was a prior housing court case or not. And instead, it tells the applicant to write to the Tenant Screening Bureau to obtain a copy of their report. Uh, however, by the time the applicant requests and obtains their report from the Tenant Screening Bureau, that apartment has long been rented to someone else, making the entire process futile. The law, next, the law is not privately enforceable in the first instance. Without a private right of action, tenants must rely on an already overburdened enforcement agency to provide redress. A landlord who receives a letter, however, from a private attorney threatening suit for <laughs> illegally denying an apartment based upon a housing court record will be far more effective in uh, overturning a denial of an apartment with the ability to do that. Next, the private right of action must include a provision for the recovery of actual statutory and punitive damages to serve as a deterrent so that landlords who do this repeatedly will pay uh, a lot more than the cost of doing business uh, by engaging in these practices. Um, and it also needs to be recognized that what tenants really want and what they really need, however, is not a lawsuit against the landlord. What they want is an apartment. The bill does not provide that solution. Instead, it forces tenants to repeatedly apply, get denied, and then and then each time file a complaint with the Human Rights Commission. Nothing in that process makes it even more likely that the tenant will obtain an apartment. And unlike the newly enacted state law, Real Property Law Section 227F, the bill does not contain a rebuttable presumption of illegal discrimination where the landlord obtained or viewed a tenant screening report or housing court records. This provision is critical because it tells landlords who use tenant screening bureaus that they will have a heavier burden in defending against a discrimination complaint if they use these bureaus. When fewer landlords use tenant screening bureaus, the problem of tenant blacklisting dramatically dissipates. Also, many brokers uh, and landlords perform an initial informal and oral screening by simply telling an applicant don't even bother completing an application if you were sued in a housing court case. The bill as written would not prescribe that conduct and it should be expanded not only to take this practice into account but also to expressly include real estate brokers from its prohibitions as opposed to just landlords. I understand that the bill does include agents but brokers are not expressly included and, and can be viewed as independent contractors. Uh, the bill also does nothing to protect New York City tenants who were sued in the New York City Housing Court when they seek to rent an apartment outside of New York City or New York State. These uh, tenant screening bureaus are national companies and the housing court records that they sell to landlords are national. So if somebody who was sued in New York City later seeks to rent an apartment anywhere else in the country, that New York City Housing Court case will follow them. I understand there's nothing the city council or the state of New York can do about that, but it's a reality that this does not end the problem. Um, and also, as a result, both the state law, 227F, and this bill provide a false sense of security to tenants that blacklisting is no longer an issue. It is. Uh, in housing court, I've heard judges and landlord lawyers tell me that since the enactment of 227F, there is no longer blacklisting, it's no longer a problem, and that nobody needs to be concerned about it. 
And I think that's a false sense of security. Uh, it needs to be recognized that for the reasons I've stated, particularly because it follows you when you leave New York, uh, that it is still a big problem. Um, a far more comprehensive solution to tenant blacklisting, I believe, is in another bill, Intro 1250, uh, a bill I work closely with Council Member Callos on, which would require the licensing of tenant screening bureaus by the Department of Consumer Affairs. Uh, and it would strictly That's restrict little. the type of information about housing court cases they would be permitted to report to landlords. Uh, and if they are required to comply with a law like that, it would entirely uh, upend the entire process because they would actually have to look at these housing court records and not just a computer screen that provides a few word summary of what happened in the case. Now, in 2011, the City Council passed the Tenant Fair Chance Act, which required landlords and brokers to notify applicants in advance if they use a tenant screening bureau, and if so, which one? So that an applicant could go to that bureau, obtain a copy of the report in advance of an application. That was also a well-intentioned uh, bill, but it is largely ignored, and uh, very few landlords either know about it or comply with it, uh, and it doesn't provide a whole lot of assistance in restricting blacklisting. So for all the above reasons, I want to emphasize uh, that I believe that it is a step in the right direction to be taking action in the, of this nature, but I believe that it needs to uh, be supplemented in a number of key ways to make it a, uh, a much more effective law. Now, with respect to uh, 1603, um, I believe that there's a lot of dovetailing between the two bills, um, and in particular, uh, with respect to um, uh, housing court records used by developers in the lottery process. Uh, I've also represented a number of tenants who had been denied housing through the housing lottery system solely because of a prior housing court case. A large percentage of people who are eligible for the lottery have a prior housing court case in their history, whether they deserved it or not. The New York City Housing Court is the largest housing court system in the country with over 275,000 cases filed there each year. Housing court cases are permitted under the Fair Credit Reporting Act to appear on a credit report for up to seven years. So when you multiply seven times 275,000, the chances are that a lottery applicant was previously sued by a landlord for falling behind in their rent. Uh, it happens to almost, well, it happens a lot. It's, it's a very, very common situation where somebody ends up being a month behind and they get sued, and that's all it takes to be blacklisted. Um, now, the, the HPD manual, or policy manual, governing the screening process um, in the, um, uh, for the housing lottery is, is uh, particularly of interest to me. Um, it has some very strict guidelines already. However, in my experience, those guidelines are routinely ignored. Um, it's my understanding from litigating um, uh, in federal court against tenant screening bureaus uh, that developers have essentially outsourced their screening process to these national tenant screening bureaus who create their own proprietary and entirely opaque credit scoring models, which the developers don't even know about, let alone participate in creating. By doing so, these developers have completely ignored their obligations under HPD policies and regulations and have instead permitted these national tenant screening bureaus to run their application process, thereby eviscerating the affordable housing lottery process. In a federal class action that I currently have pending against a national tenant screening bureau called CoreLogic um, that was filed in the Southern District of New York, my client was denied an apartment in the affordable housing lottery after the developer, Related Management, blindly relied on a screening report prepared by CoreLogic, which referenced a housing court case that had been filed against her sev several years earlier. That case involved a landlord's claim of non-payment of rent and it was voluntarily discontinued by the landlord a week after it was filed because the landlord realized the rent had in fact been paid. There was no judgment, there was no eviction, and in fact the case was discontinued by the landlord. Yet several years later, 
That housing court case appeared on a screening report prepared for related by CoreLogic, and it was used to deny her an affordable housing lottery apartment. This past December, I conducted a deposition of a corporate representative of Related in that lawsuit. And that deposition confirmed that the HPD policies and procedures for resident selection and occupancy were completely ignored, and that it was Related's policy to, in effect, turn over their screening process to CoreLogic. Major developers like Related, who receive significant financial benefits by participating in the affordable housing lottery, must be strictly regulated in this regard. They must not be permitted to turn over their screening process to national tenant screening bureaus who have no interest in, deter in determining the, extent, the nature and extent of any prior housing court history. Like intro 85A, 1603 should also be amended to include a private right of action so that persons victimized by the illegal conduct have the ability to directly enforce their rights in court and recover damages and attorney's fees. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fishman. Do you have a written statement? I'm, I apologize. I did not have a chance to print it out, but I will submit Can you, it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, we all know that uh, uh, credit score is a big issue. We know that. And uh, for tenants when they are seeking uh, housing. So what do you think, what, why do you think that uh, credit score is really a big issue for tenants when they are seeking housing? The uh, credit score. Yeah. Well, and, I, th I think one thing that has to be understood, the term credit score has many meanings. Um, there are many, many different scores. Um, as I mentioned in the uh, case I have with CoreLogic, they have their own uh, proprietary product called uh, uh, Safe Rent or something. I forget the, the term they use mm -hmm. to describe it. It's made up of a variety of factors. It's sort of like the McDonald's secret sauce. They will not tell you what makes up that score, what factors are used. And the developer told me under oath they don't know what factors go into creating the score that they are then spoon-fed by the uh, tenant screening company. So that's one type of score one that is developed entirely by a credit bureau. Then there's the national scores such as FICO, which is probably the most well-known. Uh, each of the big three credit bureaus, TransUnion, Equifax, and Experi Experian, have also each developed and uh, implemented their own proprietary uh, scores. Um, and you can pull up all three of your reports on annualcreditreport.com, and each one of those bureaus could be reporting a different score for you. Uh, because it's all based on a variety of different factors. What the problem with scoring is, though, is the, you know, the essential problem with all credit scoring, I believe, is that it makes the process into a pass-fail when it, it, it turns a subjective process into an objective process. It gives an easy way out to say, sorry, you didn't meet this number, you're out without looking at, well, why didn't they meet this number? And why is that number so critical? In my case, CoreLogic assigned a score of 505 to my client. The cutoff was 550 to, to, uh, to get a conditional approval for the affordable lottery apartment. My client was never told why she got a 505 and what she could do to improve the score. Related was told but my client was not. There was no policy to inform my client what she could do, because there is a 10-day appeal process where you can appeal the denial, but you're never told why you failed. And what, you know, if you were 45 points below the cutoff, what you could do to raise your score. It's a completely opaque process, and it's not in the interest of the uh, powers uh, that be that run these things to tell people what's involved in these scores. So I think scores should not be used at all. I, I think that they are um, exclusionary, uh, they're arbitrary, and it doesn't take into account that there's all kinds of subjective reasons. But it does make it faster and cheaper and easier. And that's, I think, what the interest is on the side of the developers. Is that the question that I was going to ask you? You say that you believe that score should not be used at all. But now, this is not the case. They're still using the score. What other alternative you think that 
you know, can be used to help the tenants. When are, you, are you talking about the affordable lottery system yes. or generally? Both. Well, I, I don't see why there cannot be a prohibition against using a score in the affordable lottery system. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that's heavily re regulated by the city. And certainly the HPD and the city council can, can uh, bar the use of scores um, and instead require more subjective information. Um, as opposed to general beyond the affordable uh, housing system in housing generally by the private landlords or in credit generally. Um, uh, I don't know that there is a basis to prohibit the use of scoring in that regard. Uh, I do think, however, that there can be legislation to require that the creation of the score be more transparent so that people know what they can do to raise their score and what is causing their score to be uh, reduced. Uh, we all know that, you know, when the tenant try to go to housing court with the landlord, that can result of them being placed in the, you know, black lease. Mm -hmm. So when you have a, t a constituent, you, you have a, a client or a tenant coming to you, anyone can answer this answer, this question. You know that, you know, the. the the tenant will have to go to the court with the landlord. And we know that, you know, you know that there's a risk also for the tenant to be in the blacklist. What type of assistance or advice that you provide to the tenant in order for the tenant to be able to handle the situation properly and to prevent the tenant to, to be uh, uh, in the blacklist? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, a lot of times we don't have that opportunity because tenants come to us at a time where they've already appeared in court mm -hmm. or papers have already been filed. So um, in the instances where the opportunity to take any preemptive action, we um, you know, may take measures as trying to negotiate before um, you know, there's any filing, particularly in the holdover cases before there's any appearance. So I think that is what triggers um, the um, appearance on the list. Um, but beyond that, um, where there are, where there is action, and um, you know there is some indication that the um, tenant is um, vindicated either by um, errors in billing or if there are um, conditions that um, you know are give rise to an abatement, um, we try to draft agreements in a way that um, you know reflects that and um, that um, you know cuts off any um, possibility of a judgment. Um, just a number of um, measures to try to mitigate the damage. Um, you know, as was indicated, it's kind of a an objective measure that doesn't look at the um, you know the facts and circumstances, unfortunately, and that's what we're trying to combat. But um, you know, where there is like any opportunity to um, you know kind of um, give some context to um, what occurred, um, we take measures in that regard, and you know that kind of happens in um, the way that we draft agreements. Uh, thank you very much. I know that uh, Legal Aid Society is providing uh, wonderful services to the people because my office has been uh, working with you guys for many years, providing immigration and legal assistance to people in need. But probably there may be a need to do some more outreach to let the people know about the services that you are providing. And that will uh, give them the knowledge and also the knowledge to come early to inform the legal aid society about the situ legal situation in terms of housing. And then uh, in that case, uh, you will be able in a position to, adva to advise them in advance and probably to prevent them s to go to, uh, to the blacklist. Do you think so? Well, I think that um, any opportunity to um, do outreach and take preventive action, we welcome that. Um, we are present in the housing courts in all of the five boroughs. We have um, offices there um, where um, tenants or um, you know anyone can ask questions and um, receive advice from us. And we also work with um, community-based organizations um, in all the five boroughs. The people who are a lot on the front lines and um, you know seeing 
um, conditions in the building and bring it to our attention. And, um, you know, that's also part of our outreach efforts. But, um, you know, any ideas that there are to, um, you know, increase those efforts, certainly um, welcome them. And we're, we're always exploring those options. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd just like to add that I, I think um, uh, advising tenants to avoid housing court altogether mm -hmm. is not um, is not a good strategy when um, when we're trying to protect tenant rights and create additional tenant rights um, and encourage tenants to uh, take action against their landlords, take group actions um, for repairs, for anything, uh, not to mention all these cases where tenants are unjustly taken to housing court or um, taken to housing court as um, like purely a, a harassment or displacement tactic. Um, and I just wanted to go back to your earlier question and um, point out one thing about the um, really unjust dual system of housing between um, our stabilized or regulated housing and unregulated housing, um, where a stabilized tenant has a right to renew their lease can take their landlord to housing court um, and feel pretty assured that they're going to be able to remain in their apartment, whereas a tenant in unregulated housing um, is going to face the repercussions of potentially their landlord not renewing their lease, but then being on the blacklist when they go out to try to search for another apartment. So the risk for a tenant in an unregulated apartment in a small building um, or a, a building that was formerly stabilized, the risk is, is really much greater for them. Um, and they have much less power um, to, um, to assert and protect their own rights. Yes, sir? You want yeah, to? no, I, I, I agree with that, that there is a definitely a, a huge disparity uh, between the uh, regulated tenants and the unregulated tenants who, who have no recourse uh, other than perhaps a retaliatory eviction claim, which is not an easy claim to establish. Uh, but it, it is also, it, it creates uh, uh, an anomaly because uh, in the two and three family house case, for example, where a landlord says, for whatever reason, I am, I'm not renewing your lease, doesn't need a reason, um, that tenant then has a choice, either voluntarily vacate and try and find another place, or go to court and defend the eviction proceeding uh, because there is a state law that allows a housing court judge to stay in eviction for a period of time, uh, uh, up to six months, and, and I believe under the new law, a year, uh, if that tenant uh, you know, meets certain criteria. However, in order to benefit from that state law, you have to first allow yourself to become blacklisted. So it is, um, uh, you know, a, a ironic uh, result that if you want to avoid blacklisting, you just move and mm. find some place else, or maybe go to a shelter. But if you want to take advantage of what the state has afforded, which is to say, yes, we understand that people need time to find another place; their kids are in school or whatever. Uh, you have to be named as a respondent in a holdover proceeding which has now blacklisted you and made it that much harder to find another place to rent. Um, so, you know, I don't know the answer to that problem, uh, but it is certainly something that needs to be recognized, uh, that this is a huge number of people in the city who live in such apartments that face mm. this every day. And this is a very tough situation to be, and I think this is a very difficult decision to take also it to is. be part of the blacklist. Yeah. And that is going to put the tenant in more problem. Right. As you said, I think this is a situation that we will have to look into. You did ask a question a minute ago that I wanted to also answer about other strategies that might be used to mm -hmm. help tenants. Uh, that, that's uh, something that I've been focusing on for a very long time in my tenant defense practice is finding ways to either keep people out of the blacklist altogether by convincing the landlord lawyer to only name them as John Doe or Jane Doe, which only works if they come to me before they've been sued. But I've also developed a mechanism to try and undo the blacklisting problem mm. uh, in settling a housing court case uh, by including a provision in a settlement agreement 
in which the landlord agrees to substitute my client's name in the caption of the case with John Doe. And then there's also a provision that says that the court is di uh, directs the clerk of the court to remove this person's name from its official record and replace it with John Doe. That document, that settlement agreement, then gets submitted to the judge, and it's now a so ordered uh, court order, which we then send to the, the court clerk and say, you now must take this person's name out. Now, this is a ver relatively new process that we've started using in the last few months, so I can't report on how successful it is, but again, my focus is getting the name out. Because once the name is out, either keep it out or get it out. Once that's done, blacklisting is solved. But without that, it's not. Thank you very much. Uh, we know that protecting uh, people's identity is a very big issue mm -hmm. everywhere in New York City and uh, everywhere in the world. And people may be in a very difficult situation because of mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. So in case of uh, housing situation, did you ever uh, hear cases of people being in the blacklist because of mistaken Absolutely. identity? And what you suggest, what you, have well, what you are able to do, what is it? Well, first of all, um, if, you, if you think of the context of identity theft, and I mm -hmm. have also represented a lot of identity theft victims who were, you know, either their identity was stolen or in a less, in a more benign situation, the credit bureau merged their files with somebody else. Um, keep in mind that in credit, major regular credit bureau reporting, the big three who are reporting mostly trade line information, um, there are two extra layers of protection to ensure that you have the right person. There's a date of birth and a social security number, which are tied to every credit transaction. Uh, and so when somebody's, um, uh, when, a tr when a trade line, uh, you know, a credit card appears on somebody's credit report that's not theirs, either because it was merged from somebody else or somebody stole their identity, there is a way to address it with social security number and, and, and date of birth uh, at a minimum. However, with housing records, neither of those identifiers exist. There is no social security number attached to a housing court record and there's no date of birth. So all you have is name and address. You have very large buildings in New York with hundreds of people with the exact same address, taking away the apartment number for a moment. The chances of somebody with a common name having the same name as somebody else living in their building is, is substantial. Um, and so yes, it is much more likely that somebody could be denied an apartment because of somebody else's housing court case because there is a complete absence of those identifiers in creating the report in the first place. And thank you very much. So uh, probably this is a question for Legal Aid Society. Is there anything that you have been able to do to help people improve the uh, credit scores? Or anything you have available to help them? Because well, the credit um, scores, you know, is really a problem for those who are seeking housing. Um, so my um, work in the Legal Aid Society is mostly around housing. We do have a unit that um, does assist consumers with, um, you know, cleaning up their credit and, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with discrepancies. I think they would probably be able to speak more um, to that process. But um, we definitely have um, attorneys and staff that um, do work to um, help people with that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my last question, uh, are you aware of any other uh, practice uh, e evaluation used by other jurisdiction in terms of qualifying people for housing, like in other state? Yes. Other than credit score? You, are you talking about to, uh, to prevent blacklisting problem or to address yes. it? Yes. Uh, well, I know that in California, uh, they passed a law um, barring the use completely of housing court records in evaluating tenants, uh, and that law was thrown out on constitutional grounds. Uh, they passed a subsequent law that prohibits or actually seals housing court records for the first 90 days uh, because uh, practice shows that an overwhelming majority of these cases get resolved rather quickly. 
Uh, and so if they're sealed during the first 90 days, then they're not accessible to the tenant screening company. Now, that is something that I've looked at as to whether that would work in New York, and I don't believe it would, uh, for the reason that because we have the largest housing court system in the country, um, uh, the volume is such that um, uh, the company that actually gets the data directly from the courthouse is months behind already in keeping up with the volume. So even if there was a 90-day freeze, uh, if they don't look at that case for six months, hmm. the case will be unfrozen by hmm. then. So I don't think that works in New York. Um, uh, right now, there is only one company in New York that is obtaining uh, the housing court records, housing court information, and then selling it to all these other companies, and that's Lexis. Uh, and the process that they use is they uh, send people into the courthouse clerk's offices with a laptop, and they sit at the public access computer, uh, and they simply take down the information right off the screen, put it in their computer, and then upload it to Lexis. And they do that every single day that the court is in session. However, what I've discovered is that there's a huge backlog because they simply can't keep up with the volume. So uh, there isn't a lot of currency in the information. So if, if a case gets dismissed uh, or discontinued, they don't know about it for six or nine months. Mm. And if they report that information, for example, if a case was filed and it's an ongoing case, but it was actually dismissed or discontinued, uh, then that didn't, the, the tenant screening company is not getting fully current information about that case, and then the landlord who's reviewing that applicant is also not getting current information. Um, and I can't say that I feel badly for the comp you know, for, for a company like Lexus who can't find a way to get information since they're, <laughs> that's their job, they're in the information business, but um, that's the reality uh, because we are the largest housing court in the country. Okay, with this, uh, thank you so very much, uh, all of you, and have a w wonderful day. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. thank you. I want to call uh, Annie Carforo, I believe. Neighbors Together, from Neighbors Together. And Naila Abdul Modi, also from Neighbors Together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you please state your name before you start? Annie Carforo uh, from Neighbors Together. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, thank you to the members of the Committee on the Civil and Human Rights for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Annie Carfaro, and I'm here on behalf of Neighbors Together, a social service and advocacy organization located in central Brooklyn. Uh, we're here in support of both Intro 85 and Intro 1603. As our city grapples with an unprecedented homeless crisis, it is clear to our members who are experiencing homelessness and unstable housing that finding an apartment for themselves and their families is imperative if they want to reestablish their lives. 
Unfortunately, in New York City's housing market, it has become increasingly difficult to penetrate if you're low income, particularly because of the unrelenting barriers landlords and brokers reinforce. Um, the majority of our members rely on rental assistance programs to help subsidize their rent. Many of them received their vouchers after a legal eviction due to non-payment of rent and were given a voucher with the intended purpose to assure that this situation would never happen again. However, the very circumstances that help them secure their voucher then prevents them from utilizing the rental assistance because they show up on the tenant blacklist. Um, echoing what most people said, the tenant blacklist is arbitrary at best, and without details of the situation behind housing court appearances, landlords have been allowed to judge an applicant superficially and most times inaccurately. As for intro 1603, we are ecstatic to see city council take steps forward to legally protect housing applicants from credit requirements. Again, echoing what most people have said, credit is a bias calculation that advantages people of privilege. You have to be financially flexible to build and maintain strong credit, and costly expenses like rent payments will not factor into your score. If you're low income or on fixed income, it only takes one unforeseen circumstance to destroy your credit, and increasingly, we have seen it become a tool landlords use to deter low income New Yorkers from applying to their buildings. While intro 1603 will help thousands of New Yorkers who rely on Housing Connect for affordable housing, the bill does neglect to include language for people with rental assistance subsidies, another very vulnerable population held captive by credit requirements. While source of income discrimination is illegal, credit requirements are not, and the lack of legal protections have left a convenient loophole for landlords to abuse. They frequently cite credit as a disqualifying factor for voucher holders and housing opportunities. We conduct housing searches at Neighbors Together, and it's becoming much more common to witness brokers turn down our members because of their credit, not because of their voucher. We do hope that the council does not overlook the opportunity to close this unabated loophole and help strengthen housing vouchers. I'm confident that a bill including protections for credit requirements for people using rental assistance subsidies will have a noticeable impact on the housing and homelessness crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. Would you please start? Hi, my name is Nala Abdul Mukdi. Um, good morning, good afternoon to the community council. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Nala Abdul Mukdi, and I'm a single mother of two, currently doubled up with my sister, her children, and her apartment. Even though I have a vouch even though I am a vet voucher holder for over a year, I felt a very strong need to come and testify today. I applaud the council, specifically Council Member Levine, for introducing Intro 1603 which will protect a large swath of New, York, New Yorkers who rely on Housing Connect for their affordable housing and from unfair and unrealistic credit requirements. However, this bill neglects to include protection for ho voucher holders, another large vulnerable population of New Yorkers who need housing, who are manipulated by brokers and landlords because of their credit score every single day. My credit is currently 628, which in, in my opinion is respectively due to my financial circumstances and the fact that I have a voucher that will cover 70% of my rent guarantee. Now, while, while I was pregnant with my second child, I experienced premature labor. My daughter, sorry, I still go through that, but my daughter being born premature, she had a number of medical um, issues and remained in NICU for three months. After her birth, the medical team and a social worker um, suggested that I quit my job. Um, during this time, I could not keep up with my bills. So unstimulately to most, my credit took a hit. And when I received the voucher, I never thought my credit would be used so de deliberately against me. Landlords and brokers have learned that they can no longer s say, I'll write no vouchers without facing consequences instead. They set ridiculously high credit requirements to effectively ban all low-income people for applying to their apartments. They already know that we, we won't meet the um, requirement, so they can say with confidence, we are seven vouchers, but you need to have a credit of 700. So now my credit, a number that does not reflect my ability or history of on-time payments, it's what's stopping me from finding a home. I hope the council understands that if I want to work on my financial stability, I need a home. These landlords don't care that in my last appointment I pay rent every time or that I have a reference letter from past landlords. They definitely don't care that I have a voucher that will guarantee my rent every month until something changes that will use this surface level number to judge my financial uh, responsibility. 
To conclude that I'm grateful for the 1603, I feel strongly that it needs to go further to protect with rental assistance su subsidies. This is a population that will continue to be held captive by their credit until a new law is passed. Thank you for your time, Permanent Council. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Abdul Mubdi. Yes. Mubdi. Yes. Thank you very much for sharing with us your story. And thank you so very much. To both of you, thank you for your testimony. Thank, thank you. you. With this, uh, the meeting is adjourned.